had a good day uh, today, uh, having enjoyed certainly a wonderful Lord's Day with the brethren here yesterday. Uh, today we did a little uh, touring around Columbia a little bit. Uh, we went and visited a couple of the, of the parks there, and certainly a, a very blessed city as far as that goes, and uh, went around the square a little bit, and uh, the others went and vi uh, visited the, the Polk House while I uh, went, ran off to the library for a little while and got some work done, but they enjoyed that as well. And we've certainly enjoyed the area and enjoyed the company uh, of you all. Certainly it's been an enjoyable time. We're thankful for each one of you and thankful for the visitors who are here this evening. I've had the opportunity to meet, I, I believe, everybody. And it's certainly wonderful to meet each of you and know that there's so many uh, good brothers and sisters in Christ here to provide their support and as well members of the community who are here to learn a little bit more. And we're all here to learn from God's Word and to seek to apply it to our lives. It is indeed the hope for our lives. We sometimes sing, There is Coming a Day. You perhaps know that song that we sing from time to time. Uh, ultimately concludes with saying, Oh, what a day that will be. You see, through our lives, we experience different kinds of days. We have good days and bad days. And sometimes we use that with not a whole lot of difference, but sometimes that difference is very significant. But Christians live in anticipation of one particular day, that great resurrection day. Indeed, the resurrection day will be the greatest day in the history of mankind. By inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul writes about this great day in the great resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15, and as we thank God for the Corinthians, as we have been doing this week and as we should do, as we uh, study through 1 Corinthians and 2 as well, we're especially thankful that it gave the opportunity for this wonderful, wonderful chapter and the wonderful, powerful teachings that it provides us. And as we consider what Paul has to say about that day, one cannot help but think, what a day that will be. I invite your attention with me to turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And let's begin by looking at verse 12. Now to set the scenario for what we're coming to, it's been spoken about that Paul says, I declare unto you the gospel. Now it was something that he'd been preaching to them all along. It was the message that had been revealed to him by God. And there were certain truths involved in that gospel. There was the death of Christ that was involved in that and that had been according to the Scriptures. The Scriptures had prophesied it. And he was buried. And they rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Again, that is, as it had been prophesied. And there were all these different witnesses of the resurrected Christ. The apostles, over 500 brethren at once. Paul would say, of whom the greater part remained of this present, but some are fallen asleep. Some have died. But he said, ultimately, and unto me, me also the less than the least of all saints, he also had the privilege of seeing the resurrected Christ. So all these stood as witnesses and have spoken about the fact that Christ is raised from the dead. That brings us to verse 12. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. As we look at these verses, we see the thirst for that day. Our bodies thirst for water. If our bodies do not receive that water for which we thirst, what's going to happen? Our bodies are going to shrivel up and die. And our existence likewise depends 
on that great resurrection day. Our Christian existence depends on that day. Christians live in hope of the future. Hope has been well defined as desire conjoined with expectation. We think sometimes about wishful thinking. There are pie-in-the-sky ideas that people might have. You know, we might say, you know, uh, you know I, I hope we have a, a Christian man as president in November. Well, folks, that's not going to happen. Uh, we, we see the options we have at this point. Uh, there's not going to be a Christian man taking the off, winning the election in November. There are things that we can wish for, but not realistically expect. But when we say we hope for that day to come, yes, we desire it, but we expect it. We hope for something. We expect something in the future. And Christians live not only in hope of the future, but also we live in assurance of our relationship. You see, if that day never happened, or if that day is never coming, that great resurrection day is never coming, another day never happened. Again, if it's so that there's not going to be a resurrection day, if the dead don't rise, you know, that means Christ hasn't been raised either. That is the logical argument that, that Paul is making. There are people in the church of Corinth who are saying, oh, the dead don't rise. It doesn't happen. Probably traceable to some extent to their involvement in Greek philosophy and following after those kinds of ideas. Uh, the ideas of looking at the flesh as evil and there being a bodily resurrection. Ooh, that's, that's nasty. That's ugly. And the idea that, that indeed evil flesh would rise again. No. They would say that simply cannot happen again. But if that resurrection day is not coming, Christ was not raised either. And what's the case then if Christ wasn't raised? Whom can a de dead Christ save? No one. A, a dead Christ can save no one. That's why Paul said, if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ isn't raised, ye are yet in your sins. You are still lost and you have no hope. You have no present relationship with God. You are not presently in Christ. You are not presently washed from your sins. You do not have fellowship with God. As significant as, significant as the death of Christ was, and it certainly was, that was part of that gospel, part of that good news, but it is demonstrated to be a significant death by the resurrection of Christ. The resurrection shows that that death was significant. Many people have died. All, to be exact, who have lived long enough to die, with the exception of two, of course. Uh, but many people have claimed their death had special significance. But only the significance of Christ's death was demonstrated in such emphatic fashion. Christ was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. When Christ was raised from the dead, that was made clear at that point. This is the Son of God, Romans 1 and verse 4. Our Christian existence then depends on that day. If that day isn't coming, we don't have that future to which to look forward, and we really don't have that past. But our human existence also depends upon that day. Mankind thirsts for justice. In Jeremiah 12 and verse 1, uh, Jeremiah would speak about the fact, I, I know that thou art righteous, O Lord, uh, when I plead with thee, yet I will talk with thee. Let me talk with thee of thy judgments. Wherefore doth the wicked prosper in their wicked ways? Why is this happening? Uh, I don't understand it. These people are walking in iniquity. They're doing well. They're doing fine. How can this be? We look at Job, the wisdom literature that is found in the book of Job, and chapter 21, beginning in verse 7. Job is asking this, Wherefore do the wicked live, become old, yea, are mighty in power? Their seed is established in their sight with them, and their offspring before their eyes. They're blessed with descendants. Their houses are safe from fear, neither is the rod of God upon them, that chastening rod. They escape it. 
Verse 10, their bull gendereth and faileth not, their cow calveth and casteth not her calf. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They take or sing to the timbrel and harp, and rejoice at the sound of the organ. They spend their days in wealth, and in a moment, go down to the grave. A nice, quick, and easy death. It's going fine for them. As far as everything goes here on this earth, you know, people talk about karma and ideas like that. You don't always see that kind of thing happening on this earth. When we watch a movie that portrays someone being bullied, what do we want to happen throughout the course of that movie? We want that bully to be held accountable, don't we? Even a bully who's watching the movie uh, wants that bully in the movie to be held accountable. But there really is no right and wrong if there will never be any accounting for our actions. If what Job observed was the whole entire story, you know, they have offspring, they live large, and, and they die just like anybody else, and that's it. Well, there really is then no right or wrong. But because there will be an accounting once this world is gone, we can have confidence then in doing right. Jesus said, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. John 5, 28 and 29. That day is coming. And so as the psalmist said, fret not thyself at the prosperity of the wicked. Don't be envious when they are doing well. Psalm 37 and verse 1. Mankind thirsts for justice, and mankind also thirsts for immortality. We look around and we see a godless humanity grasping desperately to the earth, trying to make it last forever, that some part of them might continue. We read in Psalm 102, verses 25 and following, being spoken of what God has done, of old thou hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, as a garment they shall perish. That the, as a vesture thou shalt change them, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. God is going to continue. He always has been. He always will be. He can set forth things to be likewise perpetual. But as far as those things that are physical, they're temporary. The earth on which we live, everything in it, everything physical in it, will come to an end. We think about how people are trying to make themselves immortal in these various ways, trying to make themselves somehow remembered, passing things down. We see all these uh, wealthy people trying to involve themselves in some kind of philanthropy, perhaps in part because of their good heartedness, but in large part because they, they want to be remembered. They want to leave some lasting memory of themselves on the earth. But as we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, we read the words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. But the earth abideth forever. We understand that that's within a limits, with forever as far as this uh, scope is concerned. The sun also riseth, and the sun goeth down, and hasteth to his place where he arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and it turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Under the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been... It is the thing which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which is before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are come to come with those that shall come after. Or as the American Standard Version says, There is no remembrance of former generations, neither shall there be any remembrance of these generations. 
And so we see that life on earth is eminently unsatisfying without a view of eternity. That's what Solomon is coming to understand. He's looking at things under the sun. He's confining his perspective to under the sun. He's just keeping his eyes down and looking at those things that are down here. But once he lifts his, lifts his eyes upwards, things change. He understands how man can have meaning as he looks upwardly. You see, our whole existence is torment if there is nothing more than the lives we have here on this earth. Yes, we can know that we exist with or without the resurrection. But for human beings, what kind of existence is mere existence? That might satisfy plant life. That might satisfy animal life. But the human mind craves something more. God has set eternity in their hearts. That thirst, that desire for eternity. When Jesus was at a certain well near a city called Sychar, a Samaritan city, he was speaking with a woman there. And he was, as he was speaking about the well there, uh, that woman was there apparently, apparently very proud of that well. He had spoken about the ability, his ability to give a certain type of water that he could provide. And she was like, well, we've got Jacob's well here. What well could be better than this? Jesus asked and said to her, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. I can quench that thirst. That thirst that humanity has for everlasting life. In Revelation chapters 21 and 22, we're privileged to glimpse into that abode of everlasting life. And we read in Revelation 22 and verse 1, He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. That water of life, producing life, that, that is there, that's present. And we read in verse 17 of that chapter, as we come to the close of Holy Writ, and the Spirit and the bride say, Come, let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. It's there. And we all thirst for it in that resurrection day. We see the thirst for that day. We also see the truth of that day. Paul had set forth the scenario speaking logically. You know, if Christ isn't risen, uh, you know, if there is no resurrection day, then Christ is not risen. And look, at, here's the situation we'd be in. Notice what he says in verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. The other things he was speaking about, your, yet your sins, they also which have fallen asleep in Christ or perished, those were hypotheticals. Here is the truth. Christ is risen from the dead. He is the first fruits of them that slipped. Paul states what he knows to be a simple fact. The scriptures had foretold that Christ would be raised from the dead. As Peter was preaching the resurrected Christ on the day of Pentecost, as recorded in Acts chapter 2, he said, God's raised up Jesus. God's loosed the bars of death. It was not possible that it should be holding up. And as he goes on and explains it, he refers to the 16th Psalm. Beginning Acts 2.25, he says, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord, Lord always before, I my face, before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in Hades, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Well, that's the end of the quotation that he gives from the 16th Psalm. It's speaking about someone who will not be left in Hades. His soul, will, his flesh will not see corruption. That is, he is going to be raised from the dead before his body ever starts to decay. 
And as Peter goes on and explains this, he says, Men and brethren, let, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. That is the one who wrote this. He wrote in the first person. But he said, let me freely speak unto the patriarch David, that he's both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. <laughs> that is, he wrote in the first person. He said, I, me, my. But he wasn't speaking about himself. Peter went on to say, he seen this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades. Neither his flesh did see corruption. That's what he was speaking about. This Jesus hath God raised up, he would say, of whom we are witnesses. The scripture foretold it, and we've seen it. It's the truth. And Paul himself had seen the, res the resurrected Christ, and as had been said, we cannot but speak the things which you have seen and heard. Paul had seen it. How can one explain the conversion of Saul of Tarsus without a risen Christ? Think about the mindset that Saul of Tarsus had. And Saul of Tarsus, if you're not familiar, would become better known as the Apostle Paul. Saul being his Hebrew name, Paul being his more Grecian name. Uh, but we're told about his way of life. This is described in Acts 26, verses 9 and following. He said, I verily, or I truly thought with myself, that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing also I did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints that I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. I made them say terrible things about the Lord. I compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly mad against them. I was crazed against them. I persecuted them even unto strange cities. That's what he was doing when the resurrected Christ confronted him on that road to Damascus. Paul suddenly reversed his entire way of thinking. He truly thought this is what I ought to be doing. But he changed that way of thinking and he changed his entire way of life. Why? There is no way to explain this. Saul said that he had been wrong. Saul said that his entire life had been a lie. Why? Saul gave up comfort. He gave up prestige. For what? For trials. For anguish. For the reproach of others. In 2 Corinthians 11, verses 23 and following, it speaks about the things that he had to endure. He was stoned. He was imprisoned. He had to suffer shipwrecks. All these hardships he went through. He was basically killed in the city of Lystra. All these things that he endured. And even among the churches, many of them were rejecting the things that he had to say. Why? Because he knew that the resurrection of Christ was true. Paul rested everything that he said and everything that he did. The whole life that he lived, he rested it all on Christ's resurrection. Again, notice what's said in verses 14 and 15 of 1 Corinthians 15. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. I'm a liar, he's saying, if this is the case that the dead don't rise. All these other apostles, all those who I'm working with, we're all liars if it's true that the dead rise not. He rested everything he said on the truth of Christ's resurrection. You know, there are those who claim to be modern day prophets, and there was one in particular whose prophecy about the coming of Christ did not come true. And you know what his response was? Well, Prophecy is an inexact science. Okay, that, that's a nice excuse. But Paul said, if what we're saying isn't true, you reject everything we have to say. We are liars and they receive us. Consider us as liars if everything we say is not true, particularly the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Numerous others had seen the risen Christ. Numerous others. And it wasn't just the case that a few guys with their screws loose uh, just deluded themselves into believing that they had seen the risen Christ. 
Look at the chapters which speak about the accounts of the resurrection. Look at Luke chapter 24. We see certain women. We see Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Herod, Stewart. We see Mary, the mother of James. These different women who had gone to the tomb. And when they don't see the body of Jesus there, they didn't even know why until an angel told them what had happened. And then they went and they told the apostles. And what did the apostles think? told that they seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then Jesus went and appeared to two disciples as they were walking. And the one's name was Cleopas, we're not told the name of the other. Uh, but He spoke to them, and they didn't understand any of these things. They thought that all their hope was gone. You know, they're, they're, they're just glum and gloomy about all these things. And they thought, well, we had trusted that it should have been He which should have re redeemed Israel. But he's dead. That's it. The ch all chances are gone. They had no thoughts about a resurrected Christ. And now, you think about the disciples and their foolishness and slowness of heart, as Jesus would describe it. Oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have said. While this is sad, yet it is great evidence for the resurrection of Christ. Remember, Christ convinced skeptics. These were skeptics that He convinced that He truly was raised from the dead. <clears throat> far too much existence, uh, far too much evidence exists in favor of Christ's resurrection to doubt that it took place. Again, not people who just simply made up a story and said, let's make a bunch of money off of this. They died for it. And not for something that they had been deluded to believe. Well, somebody else told us that they saw him, you know, and it was in private, you know, like people like Muhammad or Joseph Smith, you know, people who go into a cave and have something happen. And then they convince a bunch of other people. They brainwash him. There were all these people who had seen him themselves. And they were willing to give their lives for it. Why? Because it was true. And since Christ's resurrection took place, our resurrection is sure to take place. Christ is risen from the dead and He became what? The first fruits of them that slept. That's how Paul, we find, describing those who are in Christ who have died. They're sleeping. They're going to rise again. Their bodies are going to rise again. Now that's not the JW's doctrine of soul slipping. Their souls are fully conscious. But their bodies will rise again. That is coming. It's the first fruits. Just as when you have a crop starting to come up and you have those first fruits, you know, there's going to come more. There is yet more to come. Someone gave the body life. Cannot that same someone sustain the spirit's life? Cannot the same give the body life once again? That's what's said in verse 12. Now if Christ be preached that He rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Why preach anything else when anything else is false? We who are Christians have an authentic faith. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all fear is gone. Because I know He holds the future and life is worth the living. Why? Just because He lives. We see the truth of that day. Let's look then at the transference of that day. In verse 24, it says, Then cometh the end. When it shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when it should, shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. When he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, referring to God, which did put all things under him. And when this, all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also Himself be subject unto Him that put all things under Him, that God may be all in all. You see, Christ now reigns. He presently reigns in His kingdom. 
the church. In Ephesians chapter 1, it refers to the mighty working of God's power. Verse 20, which He wrought in Christ. How did He wrought? In what way was that taken place in Christ? We should wrong Christ when He raised Him from the dead and set Him at His own right hand far above all principality and power, might, dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under His feet, and gave Him to be the head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him that filleth all in all. The putting of things under his feet is, a, is represented of dominion, of reign, of rule. And so all things are said to be under Christ's feet, including death. But it speaks about he gave him to be head over all things to what? The church. There's a reference to him reigning, to him ruling, to be, him receiving that position at God's right hand on the throne in heaven. But that's the church. He is head over the church, the kingdom of the kingdom. They're speaking about the same thing. As Paul addressed the church was at Colossae, he said, God hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Wait, He's done what? He hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. We are presently in the kingdom. It's not something future. It's not something yet to come. It's a present reality. As John wrote, to the seven churches of Asia. He said, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation of the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Wait, what? I am together with you. I am your companion in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Not something that will yet be. But presently, that kingdom is established. And that's what's being spoken about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The kingdom will yet be transferred, it will be handed over to the Father, but Christ presently reigns. Now think about what a breathtaking event it would have been to be present at Christ's coronation when He received His kingdom. The apostles were privileged to see Him ascend up to heaven in the clouds as recorded in Acts chapter 1, but Daniel 7 foretells about that coronation of Christ. Verses 13 and 14, I saw the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, referring to that eternal Father, the Ancient of Days, and they brought Him near before Him. And there was given Him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and His kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Just as Nebuchadnezzar's dream had spoken about. Oh yes, those other world empires, they would be broken in pieces by this kingdom. But not this one. This one would stand forever. In Hebrews 10 and verse 12, it says, But this man, referring to Christ, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever. He offered one sacrifice for sins forever. What was that? Those Old Testament priests had offered all those animals. But it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. But Jesus Christ offered up Himself. This man, after He offered one sacrifice for sins, and notice that He offered it. And so He was a sacrifice, and He was the priest who offered it. But He also then sat down on the right hand of God. That's the position of rule. That is the position of the king. Again, speaking about his coronation. How wonderful that would have been to be pressed for that. But Christians will be pressed for the glorious occasion when the kingdom is transferred to the Father. Not only can we be present for that grand transference, it is we who belong to the kingdom who will be delivered up to the Father. The church is comprised of living stones. We read in 1 Peter, 1, 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. We comprise that. Those who are Christians are part of that. And we will be delivered up to the Father. To the loving, tender care of Him, that great Creator. The one who created that garden that we'll read of in Genesis chapter 2. That wonderful paradise. But yet we find it relocated. 
the abode of eternal life. We can see that on that day. Eternal fellowship with the Father. On that day, transferred to Him. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 1 John 2, 17. There is coming a day, but only those who are saints can look forward to that day. A saint is one who is a holy one. Not necessarily because he's perfect. Not because he's lived a sinless life. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. But yet we can be sanctified. The Corinthians had lived very unholy lives at times. Even as Paul addressed them in this epistle, we've noted that they were doing some things that were very wrong, very sinful. But as he said, and such were some of you. All those different sins they might have been. But you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our Father. Those sins are washed away. You are sanctified. You are caused to be holy. You are declared to be saints. That's how Paul addressed them. Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them there are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2. Sanctified saints. But as it was as they obeyed the gospel. Paul would say, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. I preached to you the gospel. What was it? And he went on to, goes on to say, it's the death of Christ, it's the burial of Christ, and it's the resurrection of Christ. Likewise to the church at Rome, Paul said, but God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but a glorious be you tether. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you then being made free from sin and become servants of God. You now are delivered from that. How? Because you obey the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, how is that done? Well, in that same chapter, Romans chapter 6, Paul would say, Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we bear with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. We find the death. We're baptized into His death. We're buried in baptism. And then we can rise to walk in newness of life. The death, burial, and resurrection we can obey. You see, when we do that, we can look forward to that day. Now, if the resurrection were not true, we who are Christians, Paul says, we'd be of all men most miserable. But because the resurrection day is true beyond any reasonable doubt, we are of all men most blessed. It's the day we thirst for as human beings and as Christians. And it's the day we need. And it is a day that is true. Folks, that day, that resurrection day, is going to come every bit as surely as today has come. And it is the day when we in the kingdom will be delivered to the care of our Father. What a day that will be. Amen. But friend, if you're not in that kingdom, if you've not obeyed the gospel, we plead with you to do so. If you're an accountable person, understand that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but through the grace of God we can be saved. We can have those sins washed away. Jesus Christ did offer one sacrifice for sins forever. But we're going to have to be baptized into that death, into that place where He shed the atoning blood. If you've not done that, the invitation is extended to you. Or if you're a child of God who needs to publicly confess sins, to be restored into His loving favor. Note that that loving favor is there to obtain, to lay hold of. If we assist you with your spiritual need, come as we stand and as we sing the song of invitation. All things are ready. Come to the feast. Come, Lord, the table now is spread. Ye famishing, ye weary, come, and thou shalt be richly fed. Here is the temptation. Come.
Dismissed in prayer. <laughs> 